The state last night executed its first inmate of 2023. He was a former Missouri City cop who hired a hitman to kill his wife. In the shadowy depths of the justice system, a tale unfolds, revealing the chilling stories of corrupt cops on death row. As the sands of time slip through the hourglass, we find ourselves immersed in a world where crime and safety intertwine with the pursuit of justice. In these final days, the veils of corruption are set to be lifted, exposing a web of lies that led to this dire fate. Brace yourself for an extraordinary journey into the last breaths of a tarnished soul, where redemption and retribution collide in a battle for truth. Number 1. Jack Sully Anthony John Jack Sully, born on January 2, 1944 in San Francisco, California, was an American ex-policeman and serial criminal. He gained notoriety for taking the lives of six people between February and August 1983. Sully operated out of a warehouse he rented in Burlingame, California, where he committed his gruesome crimes. Despite having accomplices who were aware of his activities but failed to report them to the police, Sully's assassination spree came to an end when he was apprehended. He grew up in the city of Millbrae, graduated from a local high school, and eventually married Elizabeth Ann in 1965. His interest in law enforcement led him to join the police force in Millbrae as an officer in 1966. For eight years, Sully served in the patrol and post service, earning a positive reputation among his colleagues. However, his behavior began to change, and allegations of physical abuse surfaced from his first wife. Their marriage ended in divorce in 1969. Sully married a second time in 1974, but his violent tendencies continued, leading to another divorce and a restraining order against him. After leaving the police force, Sully ventured into entrepreneurship as an electrical and construction contractor. In the early 1980s, he became involved with street workers using the alias Jack. He also invested in an escort agency. Sully's first known victims were Tina Livingston, the owner of a local escort agency, and two street workers named Gloria Fravel and Kelly Angel Burns. He tortured and assaulted Fravel for two days before taking her life. Livingston and Burns assisted him in disposing of the body. Oakton, another victim, was lured to the warehouse and targeted by the police officer gone rogue. Sully's later victims included Michael Thomas and his common-law wife, Phyllis Melendez. He took their lives and concealed their bodies in drums filled with concrete, which he dumped in Golden Gate Park. Barbara Searcy, Sully's ex-girlfriend, became his next victim, and he also subsequently took the life of illegal substance dealer Catherine Barrett. Sully's crimes unraveled when his fingerprints were found on the barrels containing the bodies of Thomas, Oakton, and Melendez. He was arrested in August 1983, and further evidence was discovered, including plastic bags matching those used to wrap Thomas's body and a rope used to bind Cersei's limbs. Tina Livingston, who had been complicit in the crimes, confessed and testified against Sully and his other accomplices, Kelly Burns and Michael Anthony Francis. In June 1986, Sully was found guilty on all counts and sentenced to death. He maintained his innocence in a speech following the verdict. Livingston received a plea deal, serving time for negligent homicide, while Burns and Francis received life sentences with the possibility of parole. Sully has spent his last years on death row in San Quentin State Prison. He has made unsuccessful appeals for commutation and a new trial. As of July 2021, Sully, now 77 years old, remains alive but awaiting execution. One of his accomplices, Michael Francis, has been denied parole multiple times, while Kelly Burns was granted parole and released in 2016 after serving over 33 years in prison. Number 2. Robert Fratta Recently, Robert Fratta, a former suburban Houston police officer, was executed at the age of 65 for his role in hiring two individuals to take the life of his estranged wife almost 30 years ago. Fratta received a lethal injection at the state penitentiary in Huntsville, Texas, for the 1994 shooting death of his wife, Farah. The execution took place after the U.S. Supreme Court declined an appeal from Fratta's lawyers to halt the execution, who argued that prosecutors had withheld evidence regarding the hypnotization of a trial witness. Prosecutors claimed that Fratta orchestrated 
an assassin-for-hire plot in which a middleman, Joseph Pristash, hired the shooter, Howard Guidry. Farah Frada, 33 at the time, was attacked twice sustaining blows to the head in the garage of her home in the Houston suburb of Atascocita. Throughout the legal proceedings, Frata maintained his innocence, but prosecutors presented evidence suggesting his involvement. They argued that Frata had expressed his desire to have his wife harmed to various acquaintances, even stating that he would take the blame, serve his time, and regain custody of their children upon release. Both Prystash and Guidry were also sentenced to death for their roles in the heinous crime. On January 10, 2023, Robert Fratta was executed by lethal injection at the Huntsville State Penitentiary. The powerful sedative pentobarbital was used during the execution process, which lasted approximately three minutes. Prior to the execution, Fratta's spiritual advisor, Barry Brown, offered a prayer for comfort and healing. Brown prayed for those who had experienced heartbreak and grief, both in the past and in the days to come. He also requested divine mercy for Fratta. When asked by the warden if he had any final statement, Fratta replied with a simple no. Roughly 24 minutes after the injections, with his eyes closed, Fratta took a deep breath and emitted six loud snores before passing away. The Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles also unanimously declined to commute Fratta's death sentence or grant a 60-day reprieve. Andy Cahan, the Director of Victim Services and Advocacy for Crime Stoppers of Houston, expressed hope that the execution would bring some closure for Farah Fratta's family, particularly her father, Lex Backer, who raised the couple's three children with his wife. Fratta's execution marked the first in Texas and the second in the United States this year, with eight additional executions scheduled in Texas for later in the year. Number 3. Antoinette Frank Antoinette Frank is a former New Orleans police officer who gained infamy for her involvement in a heinous crime and subsequent conviction. Born on April 30, 1971 in New Orleans, Louisiana, Frank's career as a police officer began in the late 1980s. However, her promising start would be overshadowed by her criminal actions. Antoinette Frank's involvement in a tragic event that took place on March 4, 1995, at a restaurant called Kim On in New Orleans, cost the police officer her life. On that fateful night, Frank, along with her accomplice Rogers Lacaz, committed a brutal armed robbery, which resulted in the deaths of three people. Among the victims were Officer Ronald Williams II, who was working as a security guard at the restaurant, and two siblings, Ha and Kwang Vu. The motive behind the crime was believed to be a robbery, as Frank had known that the restaurant kept a significant amount of cash on its premises. Frank, armed with her service weapon, entered the restaurant and initiated the robbery while Lacaz provided support. Tragically, Officer Williams recognized Frank as a fellow police officer and attempted to intervene, leading to a shootout that claimed the lives of all three victims. Following their arrest, Frank and Lacaz were charged with multiple counts of first-degree and armed robbery. During the trial, it was revealed that Frank had previously been involved in corrupt activities including illegal substance dealing and engaging in extrajudicial activities while serving as a police officer. In August 1995, Antoinette Frank was found guilty on all charges and was subsequently sentenced to death. Her accomplice, Rogers Lacaz, received a similar sentence. Over the years, Frank appealed her conviction multiple times, arguing various claims including ineffective counsel and constitutional violations. However, these appeals were unsuccessful, and her death sentence remained. Number 4. Charles Becker Charles Becker was an American police officer who gained notoriety for his involvement in a highly controversial case known as the Rosenthal Case in early 20th century New York City. Born on July 26, 1870, Becker served as a lieutenant in the New York Police Department, NYPD. Becker's downfall began when he was assigned as the head of the vice squad in Manhattan's Tenderloin District, which was notorious for its widespread gambling activities and escort services. During this time, he became associated with the criminal underworld and developed connections with gangsters, including members of the infamous Italian Black Hand Secret Society. In 1912, Becker was accused of orchestrating the assassination of Herman Rosenthal, a well-known gambler and informant who had threatened to expose police corruption. 
Rosenthal's attack was carried out by a group of hired gunmen in front of a popular Manhattan hotel. The sensational trial that followed captivated the nation's attention. During the trial, several witnesses, including the hired gunmen, testified against Becker, implicating him as the mastermind behind the cunning plot. However, Becker maintained his innocence throughout the proceedings. Despite his claims, he was found guilty of first degree and sentenced to death. In the last days leading up to his execution, Becker made numerous appeals and legal challenges in an attempt to overturn his conviction. His lawyers argued that the witnesses against him were unreliable and that there was insufficient evidence to support his guilt. However, these efforts proved unsuccessful and Becker's execution date remained unchanged. On July 30, 1915, Charles Becker was executed in the electric chair at Sing Sing Correctional Facility in Ossining, New York. His execution marked the first time in New York's history that a police officer had been put to death for a crime committed in the line of duty. The former police official bravely marched towards his own execution, meeting his fate at 5.55 a.m. Throughout the process, he vehemently asserted his innocence, offering a prayer on his lips as a final act of protest. There was only one instance when he appeared to falter, briefly hesitating before entering the execution chamber. Addressing witnesses, he declared, I am not guilty of the death of Rosenthal, whether by deed, conspiracy, or any other means. I am being sacrificed for the sake of my associates. In his final moments, he paid a touching tribute to his loyal wife, emphasizing her unwavering support in his dying declaration. The case fueled public debate about police corruption and the influence of organized crime in the city. The victims of the Rosenthal assassination, including Herman Rosenthal himself, were individuals involved in illegal gambling activities and had connections to the criminal underworld. Their deaths were part of a larger power struggle within the criminal networks of New York City during that time. Number 5. David Stephen Middleton David Stephen Middleton, also known as the Cable Guy, was an American former police officer, kidnapper, and suspected serial criminal. Born on June 25, 1961 in Boston, Massachusetts, Middleton grew up as the only son of a police officer. After moving to Miami, Florida, he joined the Miami-Dade Police Department in 1981. However, during his tenure as a police officer, Middleton abused his position to prey on vulnerable young women, engaging in acts of assault. One of Middleton's known victims was a 16-year-old girl referred to as A.C. In September 1990, he picked her up under the pretense of taking her to a juvenile correctional institution, but instead drove her to a secluded area where he assaulted her. A.C. reported the crime, leading to Middleton's arrest. Although he was initially charged with assault, the jury was deadlocked, and he was convicted of false imprisonment and battery, receiving a five-year sentence. After being paroled two years later, Middleton relocated to Colorado, and later Nevada, where he worked as a cable TV repairman. During this time, he became a prime suspect in multiple crimes— one of the suspected cases involved the disappearance of 18-year-old Buffy Rice Donahue in 1993. Her car was found abandoned, and her whereabouts remained unknown. Middleton was also implicated in the death of Thelma Davila, a Guatemalan porter from Las Vegas, and the death of Catherine Powell, a respected teacher from Reno. Middleton's criminal activities eventually caught up with him when investigators connected him to the death of Powell and Davila. He was arrested in February 1995 and subsequently charged with taking their lives. During his trial, evidence including credit card fraud, bite mark evidence, and the discovery of wool fibers from Powell's body in Middleton's refrigerator linked him to the crimes. In September 1997, he was found guilty on all counts and sentenced to death for robbing Davila and Powell of their lives, along with additional life terms for their kidnappings. As of 2023, David Stephen Middleton continues to reside on death row in Nevada, awaiting his execution. Number 6. Len Davis Len Davis, born on August 6, 1964, was a former New Orleans police officer who gained notoriety for his involvement in corrupt and criminal activities. Davis was known in the community as RoboCop, due to his imposing physical stature and his aggressive policing style, earning him the moniker Desire Terrorist. Despite a troubled record, which included six suspensions and 20 complaints between 1987 and 1992, Davis received the New Orleans Police Department's Medal of Merit in 1993. 
1994, Davis was ensnared in an FBI sting operation targeting his involvement in a protection racket aimed at the city's narcotics dealers. He was found guilty of extorting protection money from an illegal substance dealer who turned out to be an FBI informant. This led to the indictment of nine other police officers who were implicated in the criminal conspiracy orchestrated by Davis. Although the investigation implicated an additional 20 police officers, it was prematurely halted due to the death of Kim Groves. Kim Groves, a 32-year-old local resident and mother of three, had filed a complaint against Davis after witnessing him assault a young man mistakenly identified as a suspect. Davis tipped off about the complaint by another officer, conspired with a local illegal substance dealer named Paul Hardy to silence Groves. On October 14, 1994, less than a day after she filed the complaint, Groves was assaulted by Hardy. Damon Causey, another individual involved, hid the weapon used. Davis stood trial and was convicted in 1996 on two federal civil rights charges, directing the assault of Groves and witness tampering. Initially sentenced to death in 1996, his death sentence was reversed by the Fifth Circuit. However, a subsequent jury also sentenced him to death in 2005, leading to his current incarceration on federal death row at the United States Penitentiary in Terre Haute, Indiana. Hardy, convicted of conspiracy to violate Groves' civil rights and witness tampering, initially received a death sentence. However, in 2011, his sentence was commuted to life imprisonment due to a judge's finding of intellectual disability. Causey, convicted of federal conspiracy charges and violating Groves' civil rights, received a life sentence after rejecting a plea bargain. The aftermath of Davis's crimes saw the city of New Orleans settle a lawsuit with Groves' three children for $1.5 million in 2018. Additionally, in October 2022, three individuals who were wrongfully convicted based on false testimony from Davis were released after 28 years of incarceration. Davis has been implicated in other cases of wrongful conviction, leading to further scrutiny of his actions and the potential for more individuals to be exonerated. Number 7. Ferdy Sambo The high-profile case known as the Trial of the Century in Indonesia has concluded with a senior police officer, Ferdy Sambo, being sentenced to death for taking the life of his bodyguard. Sambo, a former head of Indonesia's Internal Affairs Department and a two-star general, received the death penalty from Chief Justice Wahyu Imam Santoso. The death of police brigadier Nofriansia Yosua Hutabarat on Sambo's command was seen as a crucial test of police accountability in the country. During the sentencing, Chief Justice Santoso emphasized that Sambo's actions had brought shame to Indonesia's police force and involved other members of the force in his crime. The panel of judges concluded that Sambo had meticulously planned Hutabarat's death and conspired to cover up any evidence by destroying closed-circuit video footage. According to the court's findings, Sambo ordered one of his bodyguards, Richard Eliezer Pudahong Lumiu, to attack Hutabarat at Sambo's residence in Jakarta. Sambo himself then fired at Hutabarat's body while wearing black gloves. The case captivated and appalled the Indonesian public, as it shed light on police misconduct and subjected the police force to rare scrutiny. The verdict was seen as conforming to the law and the public's sense of justice, with the intense media scrutiny and public interest contributing to the inevitability of a harsh sentence for Sambo. The prosecution suggested a motive for the crime, claiming an affair between Hutabarat and Sambo's wife, Putri Kandrawathi. However, Hutabarat's family dismissed these allegations, asserting that Hutabarat was in a committed relationship. Kandrawathi, who was also on trial for premeditated assault, received a sentence of 20 years in prison, significantly longer than the prosecution's request for eight years. The court held her accountable for tarnishing the reputation of the Indonesian police as the wife of a police officer and failing to set a positive example for the public. Sambo and Kandrawathi have the option to appeal their sentences, although they have not indicated whether they will do so. Three other defendants involved in the case will receive their sentences in the coming days. The death sentence for Sambo was considered appropriate given his position as a law enforcement officer, entrusted with protecting the public and upholding the law. The judge highlighted the aggravating factors, including Sambo taking the life of his own aide-de-camp and causing immense pain to Hutabarat's family. 
The court emphasized that Sambo's actions were unbecoming of a member of law enforcement and demonstrated a lack of remorse. Number 8. Frederick Lelleman In a shocking case of police brutality and extrajudicial deaths, a former Kenyan policeman named Frederick Lelleman was sentenced to death for taking the life of a human rights lawyer, his client, and a taxi driver. The conviction of Lelleman and three others shed light on a series of similar incidents in Kenya, where allegations of police misconduct and extrajudicial deaths have been a cause for concern. The tragic events unfolded in 2016, when lawyer Willie Kamani took on the case of a motorcycle taxi operator who was suing Frederick Lelleman for shooting him at a traffic roadblock. As the legal proceedings progressed, Lelleman began resorting to threats and intimidation against the man. Ultimately, this led to the abduction and death of Kimani, his client Yosefat Mwendwa, and taxi driver Joseph Mururi. The bodies of the victims were found in the Old Donyo Sabuk River, located in the eastern part of the country, days after they were reported missing. Evidence presented during the trial revealed that the three individuals had been abducted after a court session on June 22, 2016. They were held captive briefly before being taken to an open field where they were mercilessly assaulted. The discovery of their bodies in July sent shockwaves through the nation, exposing the deep-rooted corruption and abuse of power within the police force. Frederick Lehleman, the central figure in this horrifying crime, was handed the death sentence, symbolizing the gravity of his actions. Two other former officers, Stephen Chebere and Sylvia Wanjiku, received sentences of 30 and 24 years respectively, while police informer Peter Ngugi was imprisoned for 20 years. However, it is important to note that those sentenced to death in Kenyan courts typically serve life imprisonment, as the country has not carried out an execution since 1987. In his final days as a corrupt cop on death row, Frederick Lelleman faced the grim reality of his impending fate. Isolated from the world, he likely experienced the weight of his actions and the irreversible consequences they entailed. The case involving Frederick Lelleman and his accomplices not only exposed the dark underbelly of police corruption in Kenya, but also highlighted the ongoing struggle for human rights and justice within the country. It underscored the importance of holding those in positions of power accountable for their actions and ensuring that the principles of justice and the rule of law prevail. Number 9. Pawan Kumar Singh In a landmark verdict, a suspended railway protection force, RPF, constable named Pawan Kumar Singh was sentenced to death by a Jharkhand court for his heinous crimes. The incident, which occurred on August 17, 2018, shook the railway colony in the Barkakana police outpost area of Ramgar district. Pawan Kumar Singh, once entrusted with the responsibility of ensuring passenger safety and protecting railway property, committed an unforgivable act of violence. Motivated by a trivial dispute over an outstanding payment for milk, Singh resorted to extreme measures. He dared to use his service revolver during the dispute. He opened fire on a railway porter named Ashok Ram, his wife Leela Devi and their pregnant daughter Meena Devi, ruthlessly snuffing out their lives. Additionally, Singh injured Ram's daughter Suman Kumari and son Chintu Kumar, leaving a trail of devastation and despair. The court of additional district judge one, Ramgar Sheshnath Singh, presided over the case and delivered the verdict. Labeling this heinous crime with multiple victims a case of the rarest of the rare, the court pronounced the death penalty for Pawan Kumar Singh. The judgment decreed that Singh would be hanged until death, a punishment befitting the gravity of his crime. During the trial, the prosecution argued vehemently for capital punishment. They emphasized that Singh had been entrusted with the service revolver solely for the protection of passengers and railway property. However, he had misused this power and authority to take the lives of three innocent members of a single family, one of whom was an expectant mother. Subsequently, Singh was immediately suspended from duty following his horrific act, and was then arrested from his native village in Bihar. Thus began his dark descent into the abyss of the judicial system as he awaited his fate on death row. Number 10. Manuel Pardo Born on September 24, 1956, Pardo was an American serial criminal and corrupt police officer who terrorized South Florida in the mid-1980s. Prior to his criminal activities, Pardo had a background as a Boy Scout, 
a Marine Corps veteran, and a law enforcement officer. He began his career with the Florida Highway Patrol, but was fired in 1979 for falsifying traffic tickets. Subsequently, he was hired by the Sweetwater Police Department in Miami-Dade County. Pardo's criminal career began in January 1986, when he committed his first known crimes. Teaming up with his partner, Rolando Garcia, Pardo embarked on a spree that lasted for several months. Their victims included Mario Amador, Roberto Alonso, Michael Milot, Luis Robledo, Ulpiano Ledo, Farah Quintero, Sara Musa, Ramon Alvero, and Daisy Ricard. Pardo's motivations varied, ranging from robbery to a belief that some victims were police informants or marked him for death. Eventually, Pardo's crimes caught up with him, and he was apprehended in New York City after being found in a hospital with a bullet in his foot that matched those found in one of his victims. During his trial, Pardo chose to take the witness stand against the advice of his attorneys. He declared that his mission was to eliminate illegal substance dealers and claimed responsibility for at least six of the nine deaths linked to him. Pardo insisted that he was doing society a favor by removing these individuals from Earth. However, the prosecution painted him as a cold-blooded criminal who targeted rivals in the illegal substance trade. Pardo was convicted on nine counts of first degree and received the death penalty. He spent a total of 26 years on death row before his execution. On December 11, 2012, Pardo was executed by lethal injection in Florida. He maintained his beliefs until the end, requesting the glory of ending his own life rather than spending it in prison.